All right, everyone. Thank you for coming along to this lunchtime talk. It's great to see uh, so many people here engaged in this very important topic. Marco was here last year and uh, gave uh, a talk, and he's going to address similar things today, but uh, there's a lot more in it. Having seen his slide deck, I can tell you there's a lot more in it. So um, what I think I will do is uh, introduce Marco briefly and then just let him talk for as long as he wants. At that point in time, depending on what we've got left in terms of time, I have a radio mic. I'm just going to walk around and basically encourage you to ask as many questions as you possibly can. Does that sound all right? Yes? Shall we do this? Then let's go. It is my pleasure to welcome Marco Budi. He is the Chief Economist of the European Commission. At a time when Europe itself and the very idea of Europe is under siege from many, many different sides, it's great to have someone of his caliber able to come here and separate for us, separate out for us what is signal, what is noise, what is important and what is not. And uh, I will then leave it to Marco to take us through what is signal and what is noise from that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. And uh, indeed, this has been uh, uh, sort of a regular rendezvous. I think it's the third year I come, and I hope I can uh, continue to uh, come in the future. Of course. Um, you said, Mark, that uh, uh, last year I talked about similar matters. Actually, they, I was uh, looking again this morning at my slides uh, of last year. Um, it was exactly the same day. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's sort of a Halloween uh, rendezvous uh, <laughs> here. Um, and the title of last year's uh, talk was, Is the High Tide of Populism Over? Uh, we were a couple of months, uh, or you know, some months after the uh, Macron and, uh, and developments in, um, in France. Um, we were after uh, the Austrian elections also, we a small country, but where the pressure for uh, you know, uh, right-wing populists actually was very strong, which was defeated. So I looking again at my slides, and the sense uh, of um, of the talk last year was, uh, uh, you know, quite a sense of optimism uh, that uh, the high tide was uh, over. Then, and then, then uh, we had uh, some developments uh, which actually, um, you know, seemingly rolled back somehow the optimism, and the uh, I think the. Um, Example of Italy is quintessential uh, in uh, in that um, because uh, it was, I mean the first time that um, uh, we had such a radical change uh, in one of the founding members of the EU. Uh, if you go back to the original six uh, countries, I mean Italy was one of them, and it's the first time that we had not only uh, the rise of uh, populism uh, there, but actually two. Uh, different populism uh, um, being stitched together, and uh, and uh, you know actually forming a government and having um, uh, having uh, you know large majority. And actually, if you look at polls right now, uh, the majority is even um, it's even bigger than the results of the uh, of the elections. Um, I was wondering whether uh, the conclusion that I drew last year um, was, you know, would still uh, be applicable uh, uh, today from the European standpoint. I mean, conclusions that uh, was that Europe should actually review its set of priorities, focus on uh, what we call new European public goods, um, thinking about uh, security, common policy on migration, um, but also investing in uh, uh, new technologies, uh, technologies that boost uh, uh, growth looking forward, um, putting equity and fairness at the center of our, um, uh, of our policy making. Actually, um, Mark mentioned I've been uh, you know, many, many years in, in the commission, and uh, those of my generation, actually, if you take uh, the classic uh, Musgrave view of the functions of government, which are, let's say, allocation of resources, lush, you know, potential growth, um, stabilization, uh, and then uh, redistribution. The third element was actually completely absent in the way we did um, matters in Europe. I mean, allegedly, here, the justification is that you have uh, 
you have a, a subsidiarity, so um, these are competencies essentially for national governments and not for the European level. At the European level, what is uh, equity and fairness is essentially amongst member states via the cohesion policy that we have to help uh, the likes of uh, now Eastern Europe or uh, previously Spain, Portugal, Greece uh, to, you know, to catch up. But interpersonal equity was never uh, an issue. And I think there were good reasons why that was uh, not the case. But the, what I would wonder at this stage, uh, probably what I wondered last year, was whether an assignment of policies which emphasize at the European level only the harsh, namely uh, the structural reforms uh, to liberate markets, competition policy, trade policy, um, and on the fiscal side, respect of rules, the stability and growth pact in EMU, whether this is a political equilibrium. And I think I have a question mark in that, because um, I identifying Europe essentially only with blood and tears uh, is not something that politically can be sustained uh, uh, over time. And especially now that there is, a, in a sense, a, a, a backlash against um, uh, against Europe. So, I think the conclusions of last year were on a wave of a certain optimism. But I would not change them dramatically if uh, we fast forward to um, uh, to today. What I would like to do today is to look at these challenges here, but taking less of an inward. Uh, European perspective and put it in a, in a um, more multilateral view, looking at uh, global uh, governance um, and what I call the challenge of inclusive multilateralism uh, in a moment in which multilateralism and openness in general is, uh, you know, say, bitterly uh, criticized in some uh, part of the world, including on this side of the side of the Atlantic. I think the, the uh, so this is the uh, outline uh, of the talk. I think it's good to go back to um, the roots of economic sovereign, sovereignism. Um, and I'm going to look at the populist uh, pressure, globalization and technological, technological change are accelerant on both fronts, and then uh, the several fragmentations which actually emerged during the financial uh, crisis uh, that started in two, uh, 2008 and which uh, are still with us uh, today, and then go to the more policy response that uh, and the role of Europe in that. Now, if we look at uh, um, um, the populist uh, um, pressure, I think it is um, useful to go back maybe to, or to a, a quite seminal paper by Daron Asemoglu uh, and et Ali, so with Egorov and Sonin. I think it was a paper that he published uh, in Quarter Journal of Economics uh, back in 2012, uh, uh, which is the political theory of, uh, um, of populism. Uh, I mean, he, what uh, Asimoglu does in the paper is uh, he actually focuses on Latin America and the left-wing response, le left-wing populism. So, and he, um, the uh, starting point of the paper is uh, the rise of Hugo Chavez, uh, the Kirchner in Argentina, Evo Morales in Bolivia, uh, Alan Garcia in Peru, Rafael Correa in Ecuador. This was uh, six, seven years ago. Um, and you can fast forward to today. You have uh, you know Brazil, Bolsonaro, and others in uh, you know Latin uh, Latin America. Um, so one has to be uh, careful in the way one extrapolates the finding of that paper to today's uh, uh, challenges, which at the time were more on the populism of the left. Here, now what is actually uglier is and more dangerous is the populism of the right and uh, not in uh, emerging economies like uh, in um, Latin America, but uh, you know, at the heart of Western uh, economies being, uh, uh, I mean, including, including Europe. So uh, not one-to-one -one translation, but still some uh, um, interesting and uh, basic uh, uh, insights. I think when, what, uh, what the paper um, concluded is that when voters feel that politicians 
are influenced by a corrupted uh, elite um, with the estab establishment rigging the system in its favor, then signals of integrity are valuable. And uh, uh, in order to dis distance itself from the elite, these, gov these governments uh, actually adopt uh, super populist uh, uh, policies precisely to signal the distance from the, you know, the corrupt uh, uh, establishment. And here, the uh, attacks on multilateralism uh, can also serve as a signal um, in, this, uh, in this regard. Um, and one of the conclusions of the paper also is the populist bias uh, of policy is greater when the value of remaining in office is higher uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the politicians. And I think there are no um, shortage of negative examples. I put them here of um, multilateralism being, uh, being questioned. Here I list some of the um, uh, of the uh, phenomena that have taken place in, uh, lately, uh, both in Europe and in the, uh, in the US. Um, the political theory of populism that I have just outlined uh, here is what I have, uh, you know, what, what is summarized here in this slide. What I would like to do here is actually to complement uh, the paper of Asimoglu by a, di by a different one, which is uh, a paper I am still working on, and I have tried here to represent in a very uh, sketchy way. The paper is uh, you know, obviously more elaborate uh, uh, than this. Uh, uh, um, let me see if we, if we travel together through this, uh, um, uh, to the argument here, which is uh, complementary to the one of, of uh, uh, Asimoglu, but in a, in a bit, uh, with a bit of a different perspective. Basically, what Asimoglu does is that you have this uh, um, rejection in the population of the uh, of the of the elite and the establishment, and the um, uh, governments we try to signal concern and uh, closeness to those uh, to that type of of, um, of worries by adopting adopting populist uh, policies. What we do in this paper here is actually to endogenize the the uh, preferences of the um, of the population. Let me say that um, uh, here we are, as an economist and as a policymaker, I am venturing outside my comfort zone. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, especially when one economist tries to deal with uh, uh, more political science uh, matters, uh, they travel on very, uh, you know, no, on very thin ice. Uh, I would say the opposite is also the case. But anyway, I venture into that anyway. So what we have here, let's think about that there is uh, exogenous policy, uh, uh, preferences by the population. And you have the, post, uh, the preference range here is on the, uh, the x-axis. So we have more mainstream and more you know, populist uh, uh, preferences. And what you have here is that you have the government, uh, which is rather you know, traditional, mainstream, is close to the, you know, it's more to the left and the populist more to the, uh, uh, to the right. And what you have is that uh, you have P here, which, uh, 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 which is the bold uh, uh, vertical line, is the preference of the median voter, uh, essentially. And the median voter is the one that allows uh, a government to be elected. Uh, so you have to be as close as possible to, uh, uh, to that. Uh, so, Let's say in, the, in uh, a certain uh, moment uh, there is, uh, you have mainstream, uh, um, main, a mainstream government in office, you have the, pop the population which is, uh, let's say, has a certain tendency towards a more populist uh, views, but still, let's say, moderate, moderate distance. What the government will do, and here it will optimize a welfare function, let's say, a, a loss function, which has two, two uh, 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 variables in. One is the government will try to be re-elected. Uh, so what he wants to do is to be as close as possible to the, to the median voter, right? The, and the government has also a certain ideology, so it has a certain set of preferences, so it will try to be, remain close to its own preferences. So its own preferences is what you see here 
on the on the left the uh, medium voter is what you have here on the right and the dotted line here is the policies that has will be adopted something in between close enough to to have a chance to win the elections but also close enough to your own you know ideological preferences right so here let's say for ex exogenously there is a shift in preferences going to the towards more populist uh, uh, views the reasons may be those that Asimoglu uh, 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 analyzed in his papers, rejection of the elite, all sorts of, uh, uh, all sorts of things. So a, a populist government is elected, then what you have here, again, the motivation for the government are the same, close to your political, uh, uh, let's say, your, your preferred choices, uh, at the same time you know, trying to struggle in order to be reelected. So again, the, the um, what is going to be the policies that have been that will be adopted is the dotted line here on the right. Okay, this is in the case preferences are exogenous mm? and they move for exogenous reasons in the model. Now, what I insert here is uh, the um, endogenous preferences. So the idea here is that the preferences of the population actually do not fall from the sky but they are actually modeled and they are influenced by the policies that the government itself is, uh, is implementing. So take the endogenous, uh, in this case, the endogenous policies, then what under certain value of the parameters, the populist government that is in office is actually has, an, has a strong uh, incentive to adopt super populist policies, so going to the to the actually to the right of his own true preferences, in order to carry the medium voter with it, mm -hmm. so to shift the medium voter towards its real preferences. So, under certain value of the parameters, you have actually the, that the government does not adopt policies in between the preferences of medium voter and his own ideology, but actually exists to the, to the in this case here, let's say to the right, the, um, its own policies to, by, by a super uh, populist uh, um, policies, which brings, you know, the, uh, which ad ad adapts the, and uh, helps shift the preferences of the medium voter itself. Um, if you look at some of the uh, policies adopted in a number of countries, and I'm thinking about uh, Italy also in these cases, on, uh, you know, on migration, on, uh, on uh, security, on, uh, you know, and, and other types of, uh, other type of populists, of, of policies, I think you can actually, this resonates reasonably well. And one of the variables which uh, shifts, let's say, which um, um, underpins the shift to the right here, to, to the super populist um, policies, is actually the, the parameter that uh, allows to translate the policies into the preferences of the population. So it means how effective is the, the um, policies adopted by the government in changing the perception and the preferences of the medium voter. And that parameter there in the model is actually much related to the propaganda, the control of uh, mass media, the uh, you know, occupation of you know, public uh, broadcasting, and so, and so on and so forth. So that element there is very important in explaining why government adopts super populist uh, policies. And, and I think it explains also why uh, in the um, populist government actually tend to occupy, you know, media and uh, and uh, and they criticized also the the more independent uh, the independent media. So this is uh, let's say a conceptual framework that uh, is uh, I think helpful in uh, um, uh, let's say in, in try to capture uh, somehow the, uh, the the current populist uh, um, trends. Now, when you come to the uh, populist backlash, you have uh, two, um, uh, two theories and two um, uh, uh, underpinning factors. This is actually a slide I presented last year also, so I use, it, I use basically the same. 
you have one is uh, the economic roots of populism, the other one is more the cultural identitarian uh, one. Um, you have the, on the economic insecurity is the rising income and wealth inequality, uh, um, insecurity amongst the, those left behind. Um, and on the cultural identitarian, uh, you have reaction against the you know, progressive cultural uh, uh, change and the, the feeling of um, uh, identity being, uh, being un undermined. Mm? And immigration fears actually helps to um, bring together the two perspectives. On the one hand, uh, you have those uh, who are, uh, the, let's say, the, essentially the blue collars, uh, who fear that uh, immigrants arriving being relatively low skilled actually undermine the wages and the, and, and the jobs. And you have also, uh, you know, being, uh, immigrants being different, uh, you have also a, a cultural identitarian uh, a backlash. What uh, characterizes actually, and this is across the board, both in Europe as well as on this side of the Atlantic, is the rural-urban divide. If you look at the Trump election here, if you look at the uh, vote on Brexit in the UK, look at vote for Macron versus Le Pen in the, in the uh, French, uh, French elections, um, you look at the, vote, at the support for alternative for Deutschland in Germany, this rural, rural urban divide is what, you know, it's, it's the common leitmotif of, uh, uh, of this. I mean, Brexit, uh, in no university city in, in Britain, the Brexit vote had you know, prevailed, not in, in any single one. And if you look at the uh, IFT, so in, in Germany, that is, the, I think, the same, uh, uh, the same story. So what those who tend to think that uh, they are, uh, and they feel, and with uh, very good reasons, that they are threat, uh, threatened by, um, by globalization are those, uh, so youngsters, uh, workers, long-term unemployed, those who feel dependent on shrinking social benefits, you know, the turn against neoliberal elite, and on the, on, on the other side also the less educated older generation, uh, you know, right-wing um, authoritarians. L let me say uh, here that I do not belittle at all the I mean, the, the underlying motivation for this. I think this is not just a perception uh, and, you know, victim of propaganda. I think there is, uh, I think, the, uh, a critical review uh, and reconsideration of globalization have become globalism as an ideology, I think, is uh, something that is, um, has to be taken very seriously. And from, as a policymaker in Europe, I take also very seriously the fact that uh, um, often uh, Europe is seen as, uh, um, you know, fostering globalization, or also globalization at the regional level rather than the response to the to, to globalization, and I think this is um, something has to, uh, you know, to be taken to be taken seriously uh, at the political uh, and policy making uh, level. Uh, you have two accelerants uh, in, uh, in this, which uh, actually um, reinforces the, the um, populist backlash. One is, I've just mentioned, this globalization and, uh, um, and uh, uh, globalism. I think as, an, as economists, uh, we, um, we have made it very easy for ourselves uh, because what we have focused on is the overall gains on globalization. I mean, globalization, yes, I think one can argue that it has helped to increase the cake, the <coughs> volume of the cake. And then, uh, at best, we acknowledge that there was a distributional issue, but the fact that uh, the one could do, could, could compensate the losers is different than actually compensate the losers de facto instead of just, uh, just in theory. So um, we have uh, actually, ma uh, we have belittled a bit the, um, the, Im the distributional impact, impact of, uh, of globalization, and also we missed uh, another, uh, we, we missed several other uh, side uh, uh, effects of, of that, um, including the fact that we thought that at the end, uh, we thought that the problems would actually come more by mobility of capital and race to the bottom 
rather than uh, mobility of people, uh, which has proven much more difficult um, uh, to, deal, uh, um, uh, to deal with. Uh, so this is the first accelerant. The second accelerant is uh, biased technological change um, with the mobile urban elite being those uh, who benefit from, uh, is benefiting from the current um, you know, digital, uh, digital revolution. And all these elements here and the next wave, I think, if anything, uh, while providing great opportunities, uh, um, could also tend to exacerbate this uh, divide uh, and, uh, um, uh, and exacerbate the feeling uh, and the reality of being uh, left, uh, left over. So uh, we take these two accelerants, and the results is uh, um, is a, se a set of uh, fragmentations which I think are important to, under, uh, you know, to understand. I mean, the first one is uh, um, is political uh, political fragmentation, um, and what you have here, and it stops at 2016. Actually, if you extrapolate the curve, uh, it goes uh, vertically up. Uh, uh, actually, so is, this is the populist party um, uh, in democratically elected governments, huh? and most of the, here of these um, governments with populist parties, actually populist party and then minority uh, of government. But now you start to see uh, also in a majority uh, of government and uh, possibly putting together populist of uh, you know different uh, uh, different nature, so combining actually. The, the problems. Um, so this is the what uh, what has happened in uh, in Europe, and this has also gone hand in hand uh, with uh, the uh, changing um, the changing uh, position of countries. So what I have done here is to um, put a subset of uh, of, can of European countries along two dimensions, and the two dimensions they are not purely geographical, uh, uh, so north and south and east and west. Uh, from, let's say, n the, the, the division here between north and south is, uh, north and south is between uh, the emphasis on uh, um, responsibility and risk reduction in the north, so Germany et Ali, and for this, from the south, the emphasis on solidarity and risk sharing. So this is the, uh, the, the north-south divide. And you have the east-west divide, which is uh, more along the um, sovereignism versus uh, uh, more uh, favorable attitude to European uh, European integration and, and, and federalism. Uh, I sketched here in a purely subjective uh, way where countries lie in the in the in the in the four quadrants, and. Um, uh, and what is interesting is uh, is also the um, the arrows uh, moving moving around. So a number of countries which tend to shift and uh, you know seemingly change the qu change quadrant. If you start with the, the pro EU risk reduction camp, which is the, here with uh, uh, with Germany, uh, what is in the oval there is the Netherlands, the Nordics, and the Baltics. Uh, uh, why so? Um, because lately, especially with the um, political troubles of the Chancellor uh, in, uh, in Germany, I, the Netherlands uh, has taken the lead of, um, together with Finland uh, uh, and, uh, and some of the Baltics, uh, but led in particular by the, um, by the Netherlands, in, uh, uh, let's say, calling into question possible compromises that uh, Germany and France would make uh, to bring forward the European uh, European agenda. So in a sense, this, they have overtaken the, chan the uh, Chancellor Merkel on the right. Um, from these quadrants here, there are also shifts which are uh, apparent uh, uh, lately. One is Austria, with the elections of the new government, actually, which has uh, led by Christian Democrats, but with a strong presence of an extreme right sovereignist party. Austria has actually tended to shift to the right being more Eastern, uh, so to say. 
and also Spain, which traditionally in the past several years has been close to Germany in terms of preferences, uh, with the latest uh, uh, government uh, change, has moved more to these traditional positions, is more to the south together with, uh, um, uh, with other countries of, uh, uh, of the south. Um, if you go down uh, below, uh, still on the left uh, in the second quadrant, um, you have France, uh, you know, Portugal, Greece to a certain extent, uh, certainly, uh, and now uh, Spain, but you have Italy, which is actually tending to shift quadrants, and uh, this goes hand in hand with what uh, I have uh, uh, indicated, uh, indicated before. And on, you move to the right-hand side of the graph, then you have the uh, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, uh, which are more, let's say, on the sovereignist side um, uh, and you know, close to Germany in terms of uh, preference for risk reduction, and uh, Hungary, Poland, even in a more glaring way, uh, which um, strong emphasis, much stronger emphasis on sovereignism and illiberal democracy, uh, going hand in hand with a preference for risk sharing uh, via the EU budget, which the two things seem to be somewhat in contradiction. And um, this is definitely not, uh, the, those who are in this quadrant here, uh, this is certainly not a political, political equilibrium, uh, let's face uh, uh, there. And actually you can see that even Italy moving, um, you know, moving there uh, is um, not leading to uh, a coalition of the uh, of the sovereignist uh, that is uh, that is uh, anyway um, say viable uh, on this. So this is political fragmentation at the global end, with the example on uh, uh, focus on Europe. But you can do the same type of uh, analysis uh, looking uh, worldwide and across the Atlantic. The second uh, uh, fragmentation is institutional. Here you have we had the. Um, uh, the, you know, the various fora and institutions at the global, uh, at the global level. Traditionally, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, so IMF, World Bank, and then also WTO, been at the center uh, of the system, and you can see the splintering uh, lately. What has happened in, during the past 10 years is not, I mean, uh, it's not altogether negative, but the, import, the rise of the G20, uh, so it's more inclusive, uh, um, participation of uh, emerging economies, uh, I think, is a, is a favorable uh, is a favorable uh, development. At the same time, you have, for instance, WTO, which has moved out of the center um, uh, here. Plus, you have had another number of actors which help uh, in terms of um, uh, safety net uh, for, to respond to crisis. So these regional financial arrangements including first and foremost the European stability mechanism that we have created in Europe uh, during, the, during the crisis. But, but uh, you know, there are a number of uh, uh, new institutions which uh, make the system more complex. And in particular, what you have here on the right-hand side is new multilateral development banks, BRICS Bank, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, very much promoted by China, and uh, the competition that we have with traditional multilateral development banks. And very important, the rise of new lenders, China in particular, which is, uh, uh, I think, um, very important uh, to, uh, in, you know, affecting strategically the positioning of um, uh, this country and uh, its influence in several parts of the world through essentially the new Silk Road and conditions for debt transparency, which put in trouble actually some of the, or risk put in trouble some of the, of the countries uh, uh, by creating debt dependency. So an increase in fragmentation at the global institutional level. You have an increase in fragmentation on the trade level. This is uh, the number of trade restrictive measures in force before the crisis, you see pretty flat and the increase uh, after the, um, uh, during the crisis uh, for since 2008. Now, this has not been, uh, has not led to outright protectionism. Um, many of these measures here are WTO compatible, but nonetheless, they create frictions in the, and, and the risk here is that this uh, arrow here would actually trend up and uh, 
uh, with the um, risks of uh, entering into a trade war um, led by the, uh, by the US uh, in the first place. What we had also is financial fragmentation uh, here. This is a foreign claims in G7 countries. This applies in particular to, uh, to Europe, less than in, in uh, other parts of the world. Um, so we are becoming financially more autarkic uh, in, um, uh, in the world. And then you have uh, uh, this, which is uh, I'm a graph I'm extremely proud of, and I hope you like it as well. Uh, and it is the, um, I have basically replaced the Branko Milanovic elephant uh, of uh, in, in condition. You, you, you know uh, the elephant, uh, the elephant chart, so you have the thing with, so basically, uh, if you picture the elephant here with the trunk going, uh, going up, uh, those who benefit from globalization are uh, um, essentially those in the middle, uh, which is the uh, essentially the emerging uh, economy, China, India, uh, etc., which saw a large increase in income. Those who uh, actually um, suffered from globalization in his chart are the those left over from globalization, Sub-Saharan Africa, and other very poor countries, which are you know here down on the the tail of the elephant and those who are at the bottom of the trunk, which, are, which is essentially the um, working class of, in advanced economies. And those who profited are the 1% uh, or the 0,1%. So uh, that graph there was uh, for the uh, years before the crisis, so the 20 years before the crisis, till uh, 1988 till 2008. Here, what I have done in this is uh, taken basically the same variables, but looking at 1980, 2016, and I found that the whale uh, fitted in the in the in the in the graph better than the elephant. Um, uh, so what you have here, uh, the message is not all that different. But notice something is that the uh, x-axis on the right-hand side here is uh, is the is the axis extended. Because you have 99% uh, no, and then 99.9, 0.99, 0 0.1999, and you can see the, the vertical acceleration, which is actually the um, benefiting from the you know a, a tiny minority of the super rich appropriating a large share of uh, uh, wealth uh, uh, or wealth creation. It is clear that if you look at uh, something like uh, uh, like this with the squeeze of the medium and low income uh, in uh, advanced economies, you can see some you know, underpinning of the economic motivation for the, pop for the populist backlash that I talked about uh, before. Now, policy response, um, concept of inclusive multilater uh, multilateralism, going through that quickly. Um, so we should strive for collective and concrete uh, commitment uh, to foster strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. This is that the three, the four objectives of the G20, strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. Uh, I think m what is important is also develop a common global approach to tax uh, policies, uh, and knowing that um, those who do not pay taxes are those who are extremely mobile. So any country or region individually cannot actually tax uh, those uh, Capital uh, that are uh, um, you know escape the the any any uh, reasonable uh, um, uh, amount of, of taxation um, and also strengthen digital economy rules uh, um, protection uh, of uh, um, of data which is uh, fundamental promote a new generation of trade deals uh, that I uh, hear what we have tried with Europe is the, to do so in uh, new trade deals with Canada and, and also Mexico, deliver new uh, global public goods, financial stability, you know, mass migration, fight uh, climate uh, change, uh, and equip the G20, which has risen during the crisis, uh, to win the peace, uh, and not only to respond effectively during the crisis through a reform of multilateral institutions. So you, uh, this is, uh, in, a, say, in a snapshot and um, very quickly, 
to uh, uh, the things that one would need to do in order to renew uh, multilateralism. Putting order in uh, uh, and recomposing global governance is uh, what I have uh, um, I tried to picture here. So putting back the um, Bretton Woods institutions uh, with the uh, a new uh, a reviewed mandate uh, and considering the new actors that have emerged in the past uh, in the past ten years, there was a, there has been a very important report uh, um, uh, prepared by um, by um, the deputy prime minister of Singapore, uh, um, Tharman. Uh, he has a family name that is impossible to tell. So first name was Tharman Tharman Group, uh, which which elaborates on this and put forward some proposals uh, on that. Uh, it, have, the, it was presented at the uh, G20 in uh, um, Bali uh, three weeks ago and is going to be discussed and uh, hopefully carried forward at the Buenos Aires G20 summit uh, mid-November. Um, this is what one uh, should do uh, by the three main actors, in my view, so the U.S., Euro area, and uh, China. For the U.S., is uh, you know moving from inward-looking uh, strategy and a very pro-cyclical policy mix now with a very expansionary uh, fiscal uh, fiscal policy to continued contribution to multi uh, multilateralism and more prudent macroeconomic stance, which has a particular uh, negative impact actually on emerging economies. Because what, when you have a very procyclical fiscal policy and the tightening of, um, uh, of monetary policy, you have uh, an increase in the dollar and uh, um, troubles for countries, uh, especially emerging economies, with, uh, which have uh, a large share of dollar-denominated debt. So the implications for the others are pretty clear, not only for the, uh, for the US. I think for the euro area, we have to move from excessive reliance on external surpluses to find more indigenous growth uh, uh, motivation. So stronger investment, also reforms to boost potential growth, and deepening and, and finalizing the architecture of EMU. And finally, for China, moving from an unbalanced growth model and market distorted practices to more sustainable develop, development and, great, and greater adherence to global love, le, uh, level playing field. Um, the fear here is also that uh, when you have um, a trade, you know, risk of trade war, tariffs, uh, uh, threats, and outright tariffs by the US uh, on China, actually the response of the Chinese authorities also to meet their uh, uh, central planning targets uh, is to to do more domestic stimulus, but this actually uh, um, this, um, uh, reduces the, um, the likelihood of moving towards uh, a more balanced policy mix, actually increasing the imbalances within China uh, and, and the risk of a boom bust in China as well. This is uh, not for the longer term future, but 2019, 2020, are actually, um, you know, there are risks serious also for the for the shorter uh, for the shorter term. What is what can Europe do in this? I think we have uh, we can serve as an example to effective cross border cooperation and coordination. I mean, with all our limitations and mistakes, uh, I think we have a way of composing the um, let's say resolution of conflicts uh, in uh, uh, in uh, you know peaceful and effective uh, way. I think we have. Uh, we can lead the world in terms of climate uh, deals. This is one of the, we were at the forefront uh, uh, of the Paris Agreement and we have tried also in bilateral trade agreements to bring in the uh, climate um, dimension, which is more, uh, which is important and promote high standards for social, uh, environmental protection, gender equality and, uh, and so on and so forth. And also strive for fair and effective international uh, taxation that the proposals that we have had in the G20. So this is what can, what we can do and then what we should do. Uh, the domestic task is to boost our structural uh, growth. I think the 
external strength can only be based on domestic uh, strength. So we have to, uh, to have uh, you know, stronger growth. Uh, I think tackle more effectively inclusiveness challenges. I think we are better than in other places of the world because of the welfare system that we have in Europe. Nonetheless, there is a sense of erosion of the social protection, and also the feeling that the way the welfare state is organized in Europe responds very much to the uh, worries of the 1950s and the 1960s, and now in a, with a much more, more mobile workforce, uh, um, the, uh, the way social protection is organized uh, is actually less than effective. We have to complete economic and monetary union, uh, banking union, capital markets union, establish a fiscal capacity, also a safe asset, tackle the Brexit challenge, um, which is uh, here with us, and, um, and this is a very short-term challenge from now till March 2019 and adopt a credible migration policy, which we are struggling uh, to do. I mean, the external task is to overcome the small country syndrome. Europe is large altogether, but the mentality is still a small country one. So, uh, which is a bit of free riding also on the, on the rest of the world, huh? which I think we should not, we should overcome. Here, clearly, it means uh, an outburst of uh, political leadership, uh, which is, um, uh, not easy to have. To deal with the reverse creditor paradox here, what, what I mean be, uh, uh, with this is that uh, the feeling in Europe is that having a large external surplus is, is an element of strength. Mm? So the idea is that you have a bit of a mercantilistic view. You have, uh, we are strong, see how much we export, what is the external uh, uh, surplus that we have. But actually, if you take the right perspective, this is an element of weakness, it's not an element of strength. And, and puts us more into the limelight uh, for the, you know, in the case of uh, tariff th threats and, uh, uh, and tariff war. So we have to find much more indigenous domestic uh, uh, sources of growth and not relying uh, uh, on, on the external Relying, relying less on the external environment. And we have to foster a single, more unified representation of international fora. For the moment, we punch below our weight because the countries are all uh, you know, separate. Um, and I think after 20 years, uh, we can think about uh, a stronger role of the euro uh, internationally. I think this is uh, basically the, uh, the talk, and thank you very much. I shall go straight to questions. You won't hear this actually go being speakers in the room, but it's for the benefit of the camera. So if you want to ask a question, use this. Who wants to go first? Who wants to go first, Nina? Wait okay. for the microphone. Thank you. That was a, a really interesting talk. Uh, I guess uh, two, two, two questions. The first is, um, this is a very ambitious agenda that you laid out, um, very broad in scope. And I mean, could you give us a sense of priorities? So if I were to ask you, if you could only do one thing to increase inclusiveness, what would it be? And in your final slide, you had a, um, one of the tasks for the EU, you said to tackle effectively inclusiveness challenges, but you don't, would you say more about, you know, what are, what would you actually do to address those inclusiveness challenges? There are two questions, but actually, the, your uh, second question answer your first one. Um, okay. uh, so, and indeed, I was thinking going through what one should uh, do. Um, I think uh, uh, if I had to, to choose uh, one priority, which is. Uh, um, something I, that I would insert in our policy making, I think, is the distributional dimension. Uh, so, for, I, um, in the case of uh, um, Europe in particular, the uh, you know we have put the emphasis uh, traditionally on. Uh, 
uh, efficiency, allocation of resources. That's why we have, uh, we have uh, created a single market in Europe. We have put the emphasis on stability and sustainability. We have created economic and monetary union. But we have disregarded largely the distributional impacts of, uh, of these uh, policies and, uh, and you know, more generally the distributional um, implications of uh, certain coordination uh, practices that, that we have. So the, um, uh, I think it is important that uh, we factor in into, the, uh, into what we do, this distributional uh, and these fairness considerations. Um, I mentioned it before, it is very difficult to think that what we have now, Europe is that is only the harsh face of policymaking and all the tempering of the, uh, implica the, dis the in, in social implications of this uh, being left at the national le level, that it would be a stable uh, political equilibrium. So what to do uh, in, in practice? First, internationally, I think is, uh, and I mentioned it here, is to negotiate trade deals which have uh, um, social standards, environmental standards, which are uh, uh, part and parcel of the agreement. So I think this is one uh, uh, element. And I think also in the way we do uh, uh, coordination of policies in, uh, in Europe, put an, uh, uh, you know, at the forefront also reforms of the uh, labor market, of the welfare systems, which do not only look at uh, uh, the supply side, but also the, dem the demand side. Uh, and this is something that we do not do uh, enough. So I think uh, we have both externally as well as domestically an agenda which would put more the, um, the emphasis on distribution, which is, I think is important. But it is important also uh, in terms of the um, pursuing stronger growth. Because what has been, I mean, there has been a lot of research lately that show that uh, there is not uh, a contradiction, there is not necessarily a trade-off between uh, stronger growth and more, uh, uh, and more equity. And in fact, what we have in Europe is that we try to pursue so-called structural reforms, but structural reforms here, this only is essentially the, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, blood and tear uh, type. So one can help to foster structural reforms if you have uh, more concern about equity uh, as well. So the, um, I mean, some of this is, comes out of your, your, your last slide where a lot of the things you put up seem to be things that would have been there even without concerns about um, um, how to create inclusive multilateralism, right? Promote climate change, strengthen mm -hmm. the euro, right? These are all old things, right? <laughs> that, that Europe would have pursued anyway. And so I'm curious to sort of, um, <laughs> You know, if you're thinking about something that you're calling inclusive multilateralism, what's specifically different here from the way Europe would have pursued its growth and development in the past? And, and you're, I think you're talking about paying more attention to distrib distribution effects. And so, but I didn't see so many of those in your slide here. The fact that uh, they are all priorities doesn't mean that they are wrong priorities. Uh, the, uh, so, and, and, so I think uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, we cannot jump on new things until we have finished the right. others. But the old priorities seemingly, you, you said yourself, are what led to the economic nationalism. So uh, I, I'm wondering, I mean, the, the argument isn't simply we're just continuing continuing with our goals because they were the right goals because something went wrong, right? No, and no, so I mean, okay, look, look here, the, if you look through the list uh, here, there is some element of novelty and some elements of uh, you know, traditional chantier that have to be uh, finalized. Mm? So uh, what is more new emphasis is on the inclusiveness so I think that's what I mentioned. I think on completing uh, economic monetary union is a traditional uh, priority, but we are in the middle of the river now, and we are still exposed to large shocks. So 
what we need to do is to complete banking union, capital markets union, establish a proper fiscal capacity. This is essential. Otherwise, come the next crisis or the next severe downturn, and we would be in trouble again as we, we were post-2008. So I think it is, uh, uh, it is important to do these things here. Actually, the in my view, the global dimension actually provides and uh, should provide an additional impetus to, com to do what is done uh, here. I mean, we are now evidently in an anchorless world. Hmm? So we have lost the, uh, so it's probably, I mean, the G0 uh, of uh, Ian Brenner uh, being uh, under our own uh, eyes. And, and I, I tell you, I, mean, I was in, uh, chi in China and uh, India back in June. It was, it was interesting because it was, a, it was two weeks difference, so same, uh, at the same time. And what I detected there very explicitly is a demand for Europe to take leadership in the global, uh, in the, you know, global arena in a moment in which the natural leader, which is this country here, has you know, re renounced uh, that type of responsibility. One can be credible externally only if you are strong internally. So what needs to be done here is actually a number of reforms which are needed in order precisely to project that external strength in an effective way. So I would see the uh, inclusive multilateralism and the global dimension as an additional motivation to actually pursue some of the traditional reforms that have uh, being started not, and not completed, and not wait until the next crisis to be against, back against the wall and doing it uh, under duress. There are two related um, questions to what Nina said. Uh, do you see distribution happening among countries or just within countries? Because if you're speaking about winners and losers from globalization, then distribution at um, in a more global sense and not just within countries t seems important to me. The second question is, why should the rest of the world accept the continued leadership of the G20 um, countries when they were the architects of globalization in any event? And why should we, we continue to have and sanction the exclusion of the majority of the world from the table especially if we're looking at reshaping the world that all of us can, can um, be satisfied with. And I think there is an underlying assumption there that troubles me and that I would like you to at least justify why you think that um, you should continue to have that leadership role despite the failures of the policies and why you should continue with exactly the same policies because you think there, is not, there was just not enough growth not enough um, capitalism, not enough of the medicine that seems to have brought us to this place in the, in, in the first place. Thank you. No, very good questions. Um, on uh, the uh, issue of equity and fairness uh, between and within, uh, um, if I take the European experience, uh, we have uh, uh, the emphasis essentially on cohesion policy between countries. So what we are actually via the EU budget, which is uh, minuscule, uh, it's around 1% of uh, GDP, but we have uh, uh, um, about 30% share of the budget actually going for cohesion policy and transfers to countries which amount to 3 to 4 percentage points of GDP for the for the countries uh, on at the bottom scale of the uh, of the income uh, income distribution. So this the emphasis in Europe is on has been so far, and if one looks uh, at the future, will likely remain uh, on uh, um, cohesion and uh, distributional concern between countries. The idea being that uh, uh, as far as distribution within countries, so the interpersonal distribution, Brussels and, and Europe is too far for actually providing uh, an, um, an answer. My, uh, f the question I put uh, uh, before was whether uh, 
the complete disregard of the interpersonal equity is something that one could afford uh, even in, uh, in the present juncture and in the future, considering that uh, uh, you know, the identification of, uh, of Europe with uh, you know, difficult policies to be made and then leaving to the, to the national governments uh, to pick up the pieces, I think it's not something that I consider to be a viable long-term uh, uh, long solution. So I think we, would, we should try to see how we could incorporate it. It is, it is far from evident to incorporate this uh, also interpersonal considerations into the policies we promote at the European, uh, at the European level. Now, on uh, the um, on the G20, um, I mean, the G20 was uh, created many uh, years ago. Uh, it was back, I think, it was Larry Summers, uh, beginning of the 90s, uh, uh, with Clinton, who somehow uh, invented the the, uh, the G20, and it was. Uh, Relaunched at the beginning of the crisis to, uh, in 2008 because uh, the, the feeling was that uh, uh, the classic G7, so industrialized economy, or G8 with Russia at the time before the sanctions, was not enough to uh, you know, deal with the, a global crisis which affected, uh, affected everybody. They were, they were looking for uh, um, another more inclusive composition and the idea was, okay, shall we go from G7 to G10, G13, uh, um, enlarge into a number of uh, emerging, uh, emerging economies? And then what, uh, uh, they, and there was a discussion there between those who um, wanted to have uh, something which was more restrict, restricted in order to be more effective in the decision making, and those who wanted to have a broader uh, um, a broader participation and eventually the, those favoring a broader participation won and the G20, which was a form already existing, was used for that. It is true that it does not include everybody, it's G20, uh, clearly. Um, at the same time, I think the, uh, it was a major innovation of bringing in uh, into the global governance uh, the um, you know largest emerging uh, uh, emerging economies and in certain um, and in certain circumstances also other countries which who are invited even though not being full member of the G20 from you know take Nigeria for instance or other African African countries so is it enough for representing everybody the answer is probably not at the same time I think it allows to uh, to have a more, uh, let's say, inclusive management of the crisis uh, at the time. What the G20 is not equipped with is uh, be beyond helping in times of uh, crisis, so in times of inverted commas war, uh, it was is probably not sufficiently equipped to win the peace. Uh, so having overcome the the uh, you know the crisis at least the deepest um, consequence of the crisis now to what extent we can uh, have uh, a you know global governance which is uh, uh, you know fair and inclusive and this uh, the example of these uh, weeks and uh, and months with the withdrawal of the uh, US from a number of fora and quasi withdrawal from the G20 as well, because on a, we have a number of working groups, the, U, the US does not participate in those, in those working groups, I think is, a, is something that should worry us a lot. Um, a slightly more political question, I guess. Uh, it seems that particularly in the countries that have promoted Europe, in France and Germany, the answer to problems in Europe has always been more Europe. Um, and this is, led to a backlash. Uh, it's been easy for politicians who didn't like something or hearing complaints about something to blame it on Brussels. Uh, a lot of the political campaigns had to do with uh, European regulations on you know, lawn mowers or toilet flushes or things like that that kept coming up. Um, 
and I, and I wonder, is there what the chances are of less Europe, what the chances are of populists getting together with a program to cut Europe down to size, um, a la Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, uh, and whether you see that as one of the possibilities that might mm -hmm. come out of this fragmentation and resentment? Is uh, uh, more Europe the, uh, always the answer uh, or the always the right answer? The, uh, I think I, I think that is not the um, is not the case. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, actually, going back to what uh, uh, to the talk of last year, if I remember uh, well, we had a f uh, one of the finest slides which actually asked precisely your question. Um, so. More Europe would imply that you have, uh, um, you acknowledge that to tackle a number of problems, uh, the European dimension is the critical one uh, in order to do so. So think about, uh, the, you know, migration. You know, unless one thinks that to seal the borders completely, which I think is uh, neither feasible nor uh, advisable, then you have to go to a to a uh, you know you know a broader perspective, which can only be a supranational uh, one, and I think uh, uh, the European dimension is the is the minimum uh, one to deal with uh, as a precondition to 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 have an effective migration uh, migration policy. Um, the example of trade is another one. Actually, trade is one of the exclusive competencies of the EU. You know, to deal uh, now we have had the. Uh, discussion between uh, President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, and President Trump uh, on, in July. Um, I think it was good that President Juncker went there representing the whole Europe and not, uh, and not having uh, just uh, uh, you know, one country in, uh, uh, in mind. Um, and actually, if one looks at the um, it's a little diversion from your question, but I think it's maybe useful anyway to, con to, to, to understand what is happening. The, the present strategy of the US seems to be that the refusal of the multilateral setting and institutions and a, and a cobweb of bilateral deals. Um, in bilateral deals, if you sit at the table, no country individually can match the might and the power of the U.S. So that is evident for you know, more, than one, uh, more than one reason. And actually, if you look at the way uh, trade deals have been uh, designed, adopted, or uh, negotiated uh, lately uh, with uh, Canada and Mexico, with uh, Japan, with Korea, I think on the part, on the part of the U.S., all this, they have, I mean, the US got, you know, basically what it wanted. The only entity that can match the US in terms of might, in terms of the, uh, when, when you deal with trade, is the EU. Mm? So that is the, uh, that is the only dimension with, where you can have a fair, uh, you know, a fair deal. Uh, so I think we have a responsibility there. And I think there, in the case of trade, foreign direct investment regulations, et cetera, the, uh, the EU is the, right, uh, is the right dimension. This does not mean that the Europe is the response to, uh, to everything. Uh, uh, I think it is, uh, um, that, cannot be, that cannot be the case. So what I would claim, and this uh, was one of the conclusions of last year talks, which I recorded at the very beginning, is probably not more or not less, but it's a bit of a different uh, Europe. And the focus being on uh, um, uh, the allocation of resources within the EU budget away from uh, you know, common agricultural policy and the old uh, European goods to new public goods. And I mentioned before, I mean, defense, uh, security, policies, migration, etc. I think these are the, um, are the right things to do. Completing banking union, uh, economic monetary union is the right thing to do for Europe. On some of the other issues, I think devolution at the level of uh, 
national governments or even sub-national governments, I think is the right thing to do. So I would not say that the answer is always more. And a final question. So I would, start, I would like to start from the previous question and make it uh, even closer to your area of expertise. I'm a PhD student in economics and I happen to be Italian incidentally. So Nobody's perfect. <laughs> so your agenda is full of step forwards. Do you think, don't you think that at this stage um, in the European Union we should be ready to accept at least some small steps backwards to uh, preserve the basic structure of the Union and to make it even more precise, my reference is to the stability and growth path and the letter that a few mm -hmm. days ago you had to write to the Italian Treasury. Um, yes, we are writing several letters lately uh, to the Italian uh, to the Italian Treasury. Um, I I think the um, approach that we have uh, um, there and we should have uh, in terms of fiscal policy uh, making is uh, um, not an intrusive one, but one that is, uh, uh, let's say, re reduces the likelihood of negative spillovers on the, uh, on the others. So the case of Italy in particular, which is of uh, uh, you know, exiting a reasonably healthy period of growth in the past four or five years, uh, I think definitely growth uh, higher than the, the uh, potential one, um, with a, a debt that is uh, not uh, uh, decreasing, I think is, uh, is an important threat both for Italy itself and for the rest of the Eurozone. So the emphasis here has been on um, putting in place a responsible fiscal policy which would put the debt on a downwards uh, trajectory. You may have noticed that in the, the various uh, letters that have been uh, written, the ultimate goals of, uh, that this government is uh, pursuing are not criticized. I mean, nobody calls into question the, ba the basic income or a reduction of uh, taxes, um, but, one, but the, the, these are policies which one uh, will have to uh, you know, finance properly in order to allow uh, uh, you know, the continuation of, uh, of, of, of the beginning of a reduction in the, in the public debt in, an, uh, in earnest, which is a fundamental vulnerability of the, of, the Italian, of the Italian economy. Had we looked at the inside the individual policies, uh, one could have had some uh, you know, nuances, certainly, and some maybe further criticism, the way they seem to uh, want to design the uh, basic income, uh, I think one can probably question. Uh, whether a flat tax is helpful from the point of view of inclusiveness that I mentioned before is also uh, uh, questionable. Reversing the pension uh, reform uh, in, uh, in, uh, with an extremely rapid, a rapidly aging society is also something that uh, definitely not in favor of the new generations. So one can put the emphasis on those, but we have decided uh, not to do so uh, precisely, not to be uh, portrayed as being against inclusion or against, uh, you know, against the people uh, uh, in general. Uh, this, the present government, uh, uh, this is my final word, I mean, not the previous one, the present government committed supporting fully a certain adjustment uh, of the budget uh, uh, next year, and they committed that in June and July. And actually, come two months later, they have done exactly the opposite. So the reaction of the commission here was vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the word that the government had given, itself had given, and um, which I think is in contradiction, and the policy is in contradiction with those uh, commitments. Go on, then. Uh, thank you for your talk, and thank you for your Hold time. on, hold on the mic. Oh, okay. So we do have three minutes, so. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap it up. 
Uh, thank you for the talk. And I was wondering, I think you used two very interesting words. Um, the first, globalization, but more importantly, cosmopolitanism, which both in the 20th century were used as a thinly veiled guise against for anti-Semitism. So I was wondering how you think that economic multilateralism can combat the darker ideals behind economic and social nationalism? <laughs> yes, I mean, that's a, that's a heavy question, and definitely the, uh, the uh, uh, two minutes left uh, is not adequate, uh, adequate for that. I mean, what we have, um, uh, if you take a cosmopolitan set of preferences, I think what has happened in the past uh, um, 20 or 30 years uh, with globalization actually will make us reasonably happy uh, because there has been uh, you know, growth of the poor uh, in, uh, in the world. More has to be done, but I think uh, this has been a quite remarkable uh, achievement. The point is that uh, uh, not everybody has uh, cosmopolitan uh, preferences. Probably the urban elite, yes, uh, because they can exploit all these opportunities. The rest, uh, um, uh, the rest not. Uh, so one has to acknowledge uh, uh, that, and um, in, in the policies that we are uh, pursuing, take into account that um, uh, the you know, fears, uh, risk of exclusion, uh, uh, being left behind, I think is, uh, uh, is something that is, uh, is, is, a, is a real concern. My uh, claim here is that the nationalist uh, policies, which would uh, tend to move to a more autarkic view of the, of the world and regaining back control, uh, are not only um, ineffective, but they are counterproductive precisely uh, for those who are uh, feel left behind in the current uh, globalization and, the, and, and globalism. So I think we have to find a way to respond by pulling together, uh, you know, the forces. And in uh, and I find that Europe for several of the policies, not all, I mentioned it before, I think is the right has the right critical mass for uh, doing so. And we like to talk about European sovereignty as opposed to purely national sovereignty. Thank you very much, Thank you.